Okay, so um, I'm going live to do a philosophy video right now. Um, that's purely because of the reason that uh, doing a live stream rather than recording it and having to upload it in certain segments and then put, and then putting it back together via via YouTube edit, editor is a longer process than just streaming it live. And it also, in case anybody's watching while this is happening, we can kind of can sort of engage in conversation if if possible. Um, so what I'm going to be doing here is the uh, very famous article by Willard Van Orman Quine called Ontological Relativity. Now with this, this is about metaphysics and it's about philosophy of science as well. And it also, ha it also has, it talks about theory, it talks about uh, ontology pretty much, it talks about um, a couple of, uh, a couple of, issues in f in philosophy of science that are very important I think if you are into that sort of branch of philosophy so that's kind of a big deal um, I f you, you, you'll, f you'll find that in various metaphysics and anthologies and I have one I have that in a, in a, in a, in a Blackwell metaphysics anthology that I have so let's go ahead and start off um, the way that this whole thing starts is he talks about the naturalism of, of John Dewey and the whole the whole idea is that knowledge, mind, and meaning are parts of the same world that they have to do with, and they are to be studied in the same same empirical spirit that animates natural nat natural science. So this is in a way it's kind of kind of empiricism. It's sort of, but it's also kind of going beyond the empiricism of Quine's predecessors, and that's kind of what a lot of his are articles are like his main one I would say probably would be uh, the, the dogmas of, of empiricism that really turns you know kind of kind of shows him turning his back on some of his some of his some of the ideas of his predecessors like AJ Ayer, Morich, like Rudolf Carnap and he does have a bit of a conversation with Carnap in fact because there's a whole book full of their uh, correspondence so they had a whole um, had had a whole uh, correspondence between between each other and sort of talked about this this stuff. There's there's no place for a, for a prior a prior philosophy, and that's kind of we're talking about the a sort of a transcendent thing that that and that really isn't can't it can't really be applied here. He we're doing he and he's talking mostly about natural science. How do we do natural science and how do we like how do we meaningfully talk about things? And what he, what he's gonna ultimately come to here here is saying that we can't meaningfully talk about finite ontologies, and we have to turn our back on quantifications of reference uh, and how philosophy of language. This is also philosophy of language, and it's so it's basically three things: it's philosophy of language, philosophy of science, and metaphysics. So we're talking about ontology here. We're talking about how to do natural science and how to, how we can meaningfully talk about things, um, and how um, and also talking meaningfully as also in the realm of philosophy of language, especially if we're talking about reference and sort of tur and sort of tur tur turning our back our back on that whole thing. Uh, meaning is meaning of language. Or, and, and that also has to do with the mind. So this also even talks about the mind. So I find that everything that you could possibly read by Quine is pretty much, it's overarching, I guess is a good way to put it, because he's always talking about a certain, he's talking about issues that are, go up, that go among various branches of philosophy. <clears throat> so meaning meaning are can be mo models of mental of, of mental entities so meaning has to do with language and as to what words mean and how we can meaningfully talk about things and it also has to do with the mind because of um, how we understand things if we didn't have meaning then we, then we couldn't understand things uh, that we couldn't have these model entities or these models of entities in our mind if there wasn't some, 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 some sort of meaning. Dewey says that that meanings, that meaning, isn't psychic existence. It is a it is primarily a property of behavior, and there and he also, Quine also says that there is no private language, um, kind of sides with 
Wittgenstein on that. So semantics is is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, vitiated by the uh, per, by pernicious mentalism. As long as we regard um, a man's semantics somehow determined in his mind beyond what what might be implicit in his dispositions to to over behavior so meaning has to do with language also has to do with behavior and mind so meaning has to do with language language has to do with mind mind has to do with behavior and natural science also has to do with psychology as well so we're talking about many many different things here there are two parts to knowing a word there's a there's a phonetic way and a semantic way of knowing it so phonetic is obviously how you write it how you say it okay that's that's what makes up the word itself semantic is has to do with its meaning you know if you do if you do logic when you do semantics we're talking about inner inner structure here and that's semantics has to do with meaning so Quine is sort of going to have a naturalistic view of language and a in a behavior view of meaning. He's going to use that as sort of his jumping off point. And he says we give um, he says that we give up an, uh, an assurance of, de of de determinacy. When we discover meanings meanings of, uh, of native words, we must we must uh, talk about behavior. So we have what what is called here the mental museum or a um, uh, or sort of like a view of words that are on the inside not on the, and that are not on the outside. So it has to do with going on in here and that also has to do with behavior. Meanings are implicit in people's dispositions to to over behavior. Again, that's another Dewey uh, phrase. There are two two expressions alike or unlike, and there are no and there's no determinate answer under 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 naturalism. So let's take a minute to think about what naturalism is. Naturalism in science um, has to do with that we're only talking about what is natural. Natural science is about um, not, of course, not. It's and if we're doing philosophy of natural science, we're mostly thinking about everything that is empirical. We're not going to invoke anything transcendent. We're going to try to explain the natural. Naturalism and philosophy is a, I would say, um, kind of goes in a, is, could, could be explained in a variety of ways, so I, I just won't. There's, there's, there's naturalism in mathematics, ethics, everything. So, um, there's, okay, like I said there, there's no determinate answer as to what two expressions are like or or unlike under under naturalism except insofar as the answer is settled in principle by people's speech dispositions so this kind of is going to it's sort of going to boil down to use language as to what things mean boils down to use that's sort of um it's also again this is sort of getting away in in, in philosophy of language talking about meaning we have like the we have the sort of the referential thing where we're we have people like Frege, um, and we have reference, and we have uh, uh, connotation, denotation, that kind of thing. Where on the other hand, we have the something like something called the performative utterance, where it kind of boils down, and that's kind of this is a bait, like kind of a bad way to to boil it down, but it, to for for our, for our purposes here, it's about use is what gives meaning to a word rather than definite meanings or definite references so remote language translated to two to two different english tr tr translations so we have um we have a remote language that we haven't really used before translating it into two different english ones there are disposition dispositions of behavior um that that both accord equally well with observable be behavior but still it, it's impossible to know which one is right and wh which one is wrong between which one we translate into what so which translation is right and it kind of a, a lot of the 
a lot of the epistemology and philosophy of science and, and metaphysics before quiet, but what boiled down to translation between languages as to how we can translate, say, our observation statements into natural science and how we can use those things. So let's talk about like a, a um, French word. So we have the French phrase ne, ne rien. We have the word ne, or ne and we have the word rien. Uh, ne means nothing. Rien means anything. Um, and that's if we took if we take ne if we take ne rien apart, the meaning of them disintegrates. Whereas if we have them together. That means no, it's it's nothing. It's whatever. It's like a common phrase. Uh, um, so the whole okay. So he kind of Quine talks about this thing called Gavgai, where Gavgai is sort of his way of talking about rabbits, rabbit parts, rabbit faces, that kind of thing. So the whole rabbit is present when and only when. An undetached rabbit part is present, and when a temporal part of a rabbit is present. So, how do we translate Gavgai? Now, when I, when I was learning epistemology, my teacher brought in a rabbit and was doing this whole like act. It was kind of funny. Translate Gavgai into rabbit, undetached rabbit part, or um, or a temporal rabbit stage. So, we have the principle of individuation, difference over Gavgai, rabbits, parts, stages, is in their individuation. How do we translate something um, like Gavgai um, uh, to this uh, quest of different possibilities? To ask, is Gavgai the same as X? Um, the linguist um, in linguistics, that's kind of what they do is they take uh, different kind of languages and they figure out what's the right way to translate something. Is the Gav guy same as X or trying to use a identity principle to figure something out here? How can we identify Gav guy in our native language or in, in our language? Um, so the language the, the linguist develops a system for translating our our pluralizations, and the hypothesis of tr translation brings us to analytical hypotheses so and it's kind of a is, a is another big thing because in in two dogmas of empiricism um one of the dogmas that quine went against was was called analyt analyticity and before that before 1950 when that when that article was published um empir uh uh positivist Epistemologists and and metaphysicians would uh, would try to take a protocol statement or an observation statement and try to and try to translate that into be something useful for for natural science, physics, what what have you, and they would take analytical hypotheses and try to bring them into synthetic ones, and, and analytic ones being ones that we know for sure that are indubitably that are indubitably so. Um, that cannot be denied, and we, tr and we try to take those, those, those being our foundation, that's uh, logical positivist foundationalism a la more Schlick, Rudolf Carnap, and we try to go up from there into, you know, having something useful for science from real observ observation. Didn't work, P plan failed, just <clears throat> didn't work. So Quine kind of takes everything from, you know, especially from 1950 and onward, and makes into something a, a, a little more useful with science, psychology, naturalism, um, and kind of giving up on the whole referential uh, agenda. So we have a system of analytical hypotheses used to take nature expressions where um, any being the same as Fe, uh, uh, natural expressions being the same as a foreign a foreign expression. We're trying to use some sort of identity here. So where we have an analytical hypotheses, hypotheses of translations taking native sentences into English ones, and we have a workable. Can we get here a workable system of analytical hypotheses taking a, a, analytic, a, analytic into synth, synthetic? So. 
can we prove x is this is the same as y or x belongs with y um, and does the garage belong or, or uh, does Gavagai belong with with rabbit or does Gavagai have, have, have anything to do with with rabbit so and that obviously didn't work he's moving towards something better here maximum towards what is it are maxims moving towards what is are objectively indeterminate bombshell so by artificial example what is indeterminate in meaning and reference by extensions we find essential comparison rather than intentional sorry I had a gap to between my notes on this article so that whole thing didn't work. So we have what is called the indeterminacy of translation, and it's the conceptual scheme. And we have what is also called the under the under de, under determination of meaning or the under under determination of, of theory. Analy analytical hypotheses were thrown out in to, in to, 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 in the two dogmas article. So can we settle indeterminacy between rabbit? And unattached rabbit, rabbit part, rabbit stage, and Gavagai, um, and and the hypothesis thing doesn't settle this. So the the linguist in the field is going to take Gavagai same as rabbit. The maxim um, to omit in his own is his own imposition. So he's 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 omitting his own uh, uh, personal imposition, imposition on this. So. We have questioning meaning by extension or reference. That's kind of what is the big deal here. We're going to question meaning by reference, and he's kind of sort of sort of going to, sort of going to tear that agenda down to the ground. So the end of determination of translation. So it cuts across intention and and extension, even though extensional talk uh, is clearer. So we uh, so extension, of course, is talking about things, while intention is talking about like, like, model mental entities of meaning, uh, stuff in here as to how I understand that cup means cup and rabbit means rabbit, uh, you know, uh, book means book, like that. Well, as extensional meaning, um, you know, we have two books, we, we equate them, book belongs with book. There we go. But even though extension, talk of extension is clearer, there's, you really can't, um, you really can't get past that in, that in, that indeterminacy there. It's a big deal. So the inscrutability of reference. So we have we have here a systematic ambiguity, and we have ostensive indistinguishability of the abstract singular singular form. Uh, um, so we have a deferred ascension. Um, so the with the inscrutability of reference, we have rabbit and 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 Gavagai. We have a radical a radical. We could, we could take here a radical translation, where we take a remote language to a to be, to behavioral existence, radically translate that. That's one way, and we could use we and we have something called direct. Ostension, where where the indeterminacy of translation, of identity and individuation, so deferred ascension and abstract objects, alpha to to green, trying to equate things, still trying to solve this problem. We have the dimness of reference per, pervading home language. That's kind of pointing out a certain problem having to do with with reference and talk of accession itself so defending behavioral philosophy of language this is Dewey the inscrutability of reference uh, so we can we have any difference on on any terms and that's kind of absurd because reference then would be nonsense given terms cattle or um, uh, uh, rabbit parts ox that kind of thing uh, formula axiom that's you know home language so 
we have a certain a certain resolution here though which doesn't really solve our problem but it's a different way of going about it so we have a network of terms and um, and predicates and auxiliary devices we have the frame of reference and the coordinate and the uh, and the uh, uh, coordinate supply with we contemplate alternate denotations for our for our for our formula terms and we and we relate it and we and we relate to it we can talk meaningfully and distinctively about rabbits and parts numbers and formulas axioms so it's meaningless to ask whether rabbit part really refers respectively to rabbit part so rabbit part the, the language the linguistic words rabbit part it's meaningless to say to ask whether rabbit part refers to the real extensive rabbit part we can only ask this question meaningfully relative to some back background language and this is another big deal because if you you know you can't just ask one question without having some sort of some sort of uh, 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 this is kind of what Quine gets at. he has some, he has something called the web of belief in in relation to science you can't test one hypothesis that is isolated and expect to you know have a good thing you have to have um, a background theory you have to have a theory for it to fall back on you have to ha you have to have a network of terms in order to, t to test it amongst the rest of the things a part of this theory same thing here you can't ask something you can't try to identify one term with another term or something something intensive with something extensive without having a background language background language gives um, gives gives your, this whole query some sense um, could we have also given this possible solution could we, could we have a, a regress of background languages um, we end this by some kind of pointing Quain says position and velocity apart from practice and this is relational doctrine of space Things are indistinguishable except by their properties. How do rabbits differ from rabbit parts? And here we come to the relativistic thesis. To repeat, it makes no sense to, no sense to say what objects of a theory are beyond saying how to interpret or to reinterpret that theory in another. So this week we have another problem in the philosophy of science. We've already kind of discussed the problem of under of underdetermination of theory or of meaning. And we are coming on the problem of can we distinguish statements about theory versus statements about objects? Is that possible? Um, from what I've read, I would say that the, that the answer to that question is no, because you can't you can't nail down to a certain point what what to what words about a theory are without talking about objects. You, you it just really. Is, is, is difficult. So the so the the relativistic th thesis. I'll say it again. To to, to 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 repeat. It makes no sense to, to say what what objects of a theory are beyond saying how to interpret or to or to reinterpret that theory in in another. So a theory interpreted by background theory. A or we have subordinate theories and their ontologies. So what is a theory? Thinking about what what a, what what a theory really is. In this case, a theory is a set of fully interp interpreted senses. And t typically in a theory, everything, every statement or, um, or, or a sentence or, or whatever in a theory, they would have to all be consistent. Where, and that just meaning you couldn't have um, two statements in there where having one and, and also the other, you would have a contradiction. Everything would have to be consistent, at, le at least. And all of them have to be fully interpreted, having no, um, no words that we don't really understand what they mean. So how is it not meaningful to ask what, what objects of a theory are? Because we cannot 
require theories to be to, to be fully interpreted, except any relative sense of anything to count as, as a theory. So can a theory be fully interpreted? Another another issue. No. I mean you <clears throat> you obviously are going to have you're going to have background theories. You're going to have subordinate theories to sort of sort of in, interpret it. You're going to have a have an idea. <clears throat> But you're not going to have a theory that's fully interpreted. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't be a theory, and it probably would be well beyond a lot of science. <laughs> so, ontological relativity. Now we're getting to the metaphysics of theories. The ontological, the, the ontology of a theory becomes meaningful relative to background theory. Ontological questions are meaningless when taken absolutely. Now let's let, let's let's go back to the agenda of reference or of or of uh, absolute um, absolute on, or absolute ontologies. That means that we have um, we can't really have anything really absolutely. Even if we have even if we have absolute ontologies, even if we have everything figured out with respect to the ontology. The ontology of a theory becomes meaningful relative to background theory. Ontological questions are meaningless when taken out absolutely. So, what is the logical form of a theory? Theory interpreted by picking a new universe for its variables of quantification to range over. And that's theory from assigning new names and objects. These are, these are models of a theory. We have no real intended uh, no real intended in, intended models so a theory in, in, in interpreted by picking a new universe for its for its variables of of quantification to range over and here we would we here, here we have something famous which is called a proxy function and this is uh, reducing one ontology to another and this need not and it need not be be one to one so this is a function mapping one universe into part or all of its of its other and this is kind of like like girdle sets girdle mem girdle no or, or, or girdle numbers um, so reducing universe u to another v by proxy function now where this can be problematic is where we get down to what is called a, a reductio ad absurdum we needn't assume old ontology but uh it, but unless we are assuming a falsehood to to disprove and this the, thus we have a ontological re reduction so getting down to the nitty-gritty here ontology of, of a theory demanding demanding a stringency of demands upon background theory and there's three grades of stringency one explain what things a theory is about or what th things it terms its terms denote showing how we propose to, to relate terms of object theory to, to, to terms of ba a background theory with some uh with, with some arbitrariness number, number two then that, that's the, the, that was the one, one with the smallest stringency number two proxy function used to reduce an ontology u to v uh, via reductio ad, ad absurdum. Number three, this is the biggest ontological reduction via the Lohenheim Skullum theorem. And that, that theorem is if any theory has by its its own account an, ended, an, an indenumerable, indenumerable universe, then by taking that whole unreduced theory as background theory, we cannot hope to produce a pr proxy function that's adequate to reducing the, the the ontology to a a denumerable one. So that's kind of a basic mathematical thing. We need a stronger background theory, even even if it's a even if it's a virtual one, to reduce our original theory. So so that's then this is a case where we can't do the the reductio ad absurdum. So, ontological relativity is means a finite universe, like I said in the, in, 
in the, in the beginning, a finite universe of named objects, and there's no occasion for for quantification. We need a broader containing theory to talk meaningfully about finite ontologies, and we need to turn our backs on questions of, of reference. And this could possibly take turn us to a coherence theory, but the the ultimate thing, whatever kind of a, whatever kind of strategy is, is chosen here, whether it has to do with um, the uh, uh, the uh, reductio or the proxy function um, or the um, or the having to do with the Lewenheim Skolem theorem, there just has to be a bigger theory, and theories have, have to have have to have background theories or you know or and other ones around it to fall back on, and we have to turn our back on questions of reference and quantification in order to ever talk meaningfully about anything in, in, in science. So I'm sorry that was kind of a long one, but I think it needed to be done. That was about half an hour. But uh, let me know your thoughts or if you have any issues or questions or if I mess something up. If you're a huge expert on this and you, you think I messed up uh, or said, said something wrong, let me know in the comments. I'd love to discuss this stuff with you. Thank you very much for watching.